Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning, everyone. It's been three years since we've actually had a natural fiber session here at Outlook. Over the past couple of years, as Paul mentioned, we've been focusing on the sheep industry because of some of the changing dynamics that we were seeing in that industry. We looked at why producers were sticking with wool or why some of them were getting out of wool and more into meat production. And we also looked at the predominance of breeding strategies that have evolved over the past decade or so that have resulted in sheep being more dual purpose animals that satisfy two sources of demand, that for meat and that for wool. And it's the meeting of demand, meeting the demand of consumers, is that's the reason we do what we do, that all members of the agricultural sector do what we do. And for the natural fibers industry, as suppliers of raw product, we are increasingly responding to a consumer group that is better informed about the source of the fiber they purchase and about the source of the clothing that they purchase. Innovations in both the cotton and wool industries over the past decade have brought these industries to the point where they've been able to step up to the tougher producing environment. And I mean that not just in terms of the climate, but also in terms of the increasing scrutiny of consumers. And both industries have continued to advance. And that's why this year the invited speakers are not from the land, but from the market. And they'll highlight some of those properties that our fibers have that are supporting the sustainability of these respective industries. But of course, my role is to come back to the market and to discuss those signals that are providing the information that lead to responses by both industries. Let's touch first at supply and demand. We have supply and demand factors that, at least for the next year or two, are very favorable for returns to producers. On the supply side, and this, the, these favorable indicators is what I've marked by the upward orange arrows. On the supply side, we've had exceptional rainfall in spring, and that's led to an increase in the supply of both commodities. And that allows producers to benefit from the better uh, signals that we're getting from the demand side. On the demand side, we have the gradual strengthening of economic growth in global markets, particularly the United States and the European Union that are major importers of apparel. At the same time, demand from China, which is the principal export market for both wool and Australian cotton, remains solid. Despite the gradual easing of economic growth assumed over the next five years, the expectation for sustained strong retail growth will support demand for Australian natural fibers. Also lending support to demand is the assumed weaker dollar over the medium term, which makes Australian commodities relatively more competitive. The competitiveness with synthetics has been rather challenging over the past few years, given the low, price, uh, low crude oil price, but that too has started to increase, and the World Bank projects that world oil prices will be rising over the medium term. And that will assist demand for natural fibers as well. And that's what it's all about. It's about meeting demand understanding where it comes from, understanding what the market needs. I'd like to touch first and spend a bit of time discussing the cotton market. Globally, consumption growth from non-OECD apparel consuming countries where the garment industries are expanding quickly is putting upward pressure on cotton prices. Production has been rising in response to the price signals with a larger area planted to cotton. However, global consumption has outpaced production yet again, and it's forecast to continue doing so over the medium term. To satisfy that demand, we expect a further drawdown of global stocks, and that will be one of the factors that continues to support the world indicator price of cotton. I want to touch on this stocks issue for a moment. Warren Preston from the USDA this morning, it was very interesting to see that um, he was showing for grains anyway, the world product, that world production was outpacing world consumption. But for cotton, that's not true. And he touched on the issue of China. Up until a few years ago, the story when it came to uh, cotton was about the increasing stocks in China and how that was distorting the world price of cotton. Within China, producers were being supported by government policy, and we had a huge buildup of reserves. China is one of the world's largest producers of cotton. It is also the world's largest <coughs> importer of cotton. But that support policy that China had, those prices, they started to come down in 
And that's made China's producers far more susceptible to changes in the market. There have been increases in pr production prices. There has also been uh, lower returns compared to alternative crops in China. And for that reason, Chinese production of cotton has begun to fall. But that doesn't mean demand by cotton processors in China has fallen. They still require the fiber in order to supply their consumer demand. And how they've been doing that is by drawing down their national reserves. But as Warren Preston uh, intimated, there are questions about the quality of that cotton in reserves. And that's why there continues to be demand for Australian high quality fiber. Because the Chinese processors need to produce apparel of a high standard for their consumers. And they cannot do that with their own production. And that's why there is always an avenue of growth for Australian fiber. Over the medium term, we expect cotton stocks to be drawn down. We expect them to fall by about 17% this year and 17% next year. And according to China's five-year plan, which is the main policy document released by the Chinese government, they also ex have also reported that they expect national reserves of cotton to be drawn down. And that's why we're expecting over the medium term imports of cotton by China to increase, and that will add additional support to prices. With world cotton production expected to increase, how the Australian industry distinguishes itself will become increasingly important. The Australian industry has been working for several decades at improving its production techniques using the best management practices, improving factors such as water use and chemical application, and it's also been working strongly to engage with retailers. Its growers have become more responsible and more accountable for what they do and how they do it in order to demonstrate to cotton consumers that not only is co Australian cotton high quality, but how that cotton is produced is of the highest standard. And that assists the industry with its social license to produce at a time when both how food and fiber are being produced are being looked at more scrupulously by consumers. And not only by consumers, but there are also some negative influences coming from the competing industries, like synthetics, that are trying to draw attention to the negative aspects on how natural fibers are produced in order to get a step up in the retail market. The cotton industry's initiatives have assisted with returns to growers here at home, which are higher, the returns to Australian growers are higher than the average return to growers around the world because of the high quality that we consistently produce. So let me turn now to the Australian forecast. The price signals over the past few years have supported the planting of cotton, which is expected to have doubled this year. And that will lead to a 65% increase in cotton production this year compared to last at about a million tons. And given the ample water supplies available in our dams, we expect produ production to be about 9% higher next year as well. And there will be an associated increase in exports. Returns to Australian cotton growers, which is what our producers are really interested in, are expected to remain relatively high compared to a 10-year average up to last year and waver by about uh, $580 to $600 a bale over the medium term. Those relatively high prices are expected to support plantings and production is therefore expected to remain above that 10-year average. I'll turn our attention now to wool. Certainly the natural fibers industry in Australia, they really face similar challenges, particularly these days with that negative influence coming from the competing synthetics industries. But certainly wool is no stranger to controversy, and it's been contending with these challenges for a very long time, while at the same time watching their share of the global fiber market contract. But wool has slowly reshaped itself. It's now more of a higher value niche product for higher income consumers. And it's being used increasingly in non-traditional ways that Angus and Professor Sue will be talking about shortly. So let's get to our forecast. Again, the very good rainfall in spring led to some excellent pasture growth, and that has supported flock rebuilding and wool production. And that has allowed producers to benefit from the favorable prices. You can see here that the price of Australian wool in Australian dollar terms has been rising since about 2014, although that increase was a bit more delayed in US dollars. Returns to Australian producers were supported by the depreciation of the Australian dollar at about that time in 2014. 
With the constrained supply of apparel wool over the past four years because of the very high slaughter rates we were seeing uh, in the sheep industry, given the strengthening demand that we have coming on from China now, as well as from some smaller importers in, in uh, Italy and in the Czech Republic, we're seeing considerable upward movement in the Eastern market indicator price. In fact, over the past two years, since January 2015, the Eastern market indicator price has increased by about 35%. So what do these price signals mean for production? Certainly with strengthening prices, there are fewer incentives than there used to be, even you know, five, six years ago, to get out of wool. By the end of the financial year, we are forecasting that wool production in Australia we will be about 5% higher than last year and will trend upward over the medium term as with the assumption of assumed climate conditions, we assume, assume flock rebuilding to continue, and that will result in higher fleece, uh, higher fleece weights, as well as higher total production. As the supply of wool increases, we expect that, that price to come off in real terms, but to still remain relatively high. Exports of wool will follow this trend, and China will continue to buy about three quarters of our clip. What's interesting, though, is what wool is being demanded from us. We've known for a long time now that the share of wool in the world fiber market has been contracting. Australia's exports of raw wool have wavered between 300 to about 330 kilotons over the past five years or so, in line with the size of the flock. What's interesting is the strengthening in demand for fine wool, which, is, which has become a larger proportion of our total clip and also of our total exports. It is the strong increase in demand for our fine and super fine wool that's really driving that increase in the Eastern market indicator price. And even though it's subtle, um, there's been also a slighter, larger share of broader wools in the industry as we're supplying more meat um, to um, ex our export markets. So when it comes to that fine wool, we always ask, you know, who's buying it? What's influencing that demand side? And we always speak about strengthening demand from the United States and the European Union and their influence in turn on China's demand for our raw fiber. But imports of wool and apparel by those countries haven't been strengthening very much over the past five years or so. And that's largely been a factor of weak economic growth and of weak consumer confidence. But we're slowly seeing a turnaround, and there is optimism that growing uh, consumer confidence will have a positive influence on demand, both there and the United States. And thankfully, the softer demand that we've been seeing from those two countries over the past five years has been offset by that strengthening retail demand in China. Wool and apparel in China is highly regarded. Consumers of wool and apparel in China are a higher, from higher income households, which constitutes a rising demographic. And although that is still a relatively small proportion of the total population, in terms of absolute number of people, it's very large. It's meeting the demands of those consumers and of all increasingly discerning and informed consumers of both cotton and wool that will require the industries continue to move forward to find new ways of distinguishing themselves from their competitors. And that's not just competitors who also produce wool and cotton, but in particular the synthetics industry. And of finding new avenues for growth. It's through the industry's innovations that both industries have set themselves up to be accountable to not only processors of our raw fiber, but ultimately to the final consumers. And it's because of our consumers that we must continue to invest in our industries to maintain our social license to produce and to innovate so we continue to make our fibers relevant and distinct in today's marketplace. Thank you very much.